Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series, lesson number two in a new series, we should say, on the book of Acts, entitled simply Pentecost. This is a lesson for July 14 of 2018 and will prove to be very interesting, I think. We always begin with a word of prayer, so we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we do so. Our wonderful Father, once again we thank you for this insight into how your final messages for the world were, got started back 2,000 years ago. What happened there at Pentecost? How did it prepare the disciples for the work that they were to be given to do? And how might that impact us as we seek to try to finish that work in our day? Help us to see what it is you want us to do with our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Pentecost was one of the three major festivals in the Jewish sacred year. What were the other ones? Passover. Passover. Day of Atonement. Okay. So, uh, and two, two of them, one came early in the spring. This one, Pentecost, came usually about what we would say June. And then, of course, the Day of Atonement came in the fall, Yom Kippur came in the fall, September, October. So that's about how they were spread out. Where does the name Pentecost come from? That's the Greek word for 50. And it, it's called Pentecost because it comes exactly 50 days after Passover. Passover. So what can we learn from their experiences? What happened on that momentous occasion? Well, first of all, let's talk about what might have prepared them for that occasion. What happened in those 50 days between the crucifixion, the resurrection, and Pentecost? Well, we know that they met with Jesus, didn't they? On Sunday night of, re of, of resurrection. And we know that a week later, he met with them again, and this time Thomas was with them, right? We know those for sure. That, that's John 20, verses 24 to 29. We know that sometime later, we don't know exactly the timing, all the disciples, or at least some of them, traveled to Galilee, and there, along with about 500 other people, met Jesus on a certain hilltop. We don't know where. That's in Matthew 28, 16 to 20, and 1 Corinthians 15, 6. But as the time for Pentecost drew near, they returned to Jerusalem. It was a time of reconciliation and self-examination. Kerry, can you tell us about that? Yes. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world, and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. That comes from Acts of the Apostles, page 37, paragraph 2. So, and we don't know exactly the timing of those events, but we know that 40 days after the resurrection, what happened? Jesus was with them, yes? No comment? Jesus was with them, and what happened? He, he, he led them out, and I'm sure people watched them. They must have been very, I don't know, I, I wonder, because Jesus was clearly in Jerusalem. I mean, did any of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, did any of them see Jesus? The people who saw Jesus in Jerusalem, did they flock to him to ask for healing? We don't know. I would have thought so. I mean, why not? Okay. For the next 10 days, well, anyway, so Jesus led them out of Jerusalem, down through the Kidron Valley, up over the Mount of Olives, and as we know, on the other side, they, Jesus ascended to heaven. What happened in the next 10 days? Well, we just read about it uh, in Acts of the Apostles. They, yeah. they, were, they came together, and now they weren't striving 
to, for the first place, say, who's going to be prime minister? That, they'd forgotten about that. They were together. They prayed together. They fasted together. They reconciled. They were no longer, you know, rival entities. They were a group together, and they had one goal in mind. And what was that goal? Do what they were told to do. Go out and spread the gospel. They had a burden for souls. So yeah. it wasn't just, oh, I got to do this thing, and I hate these people, but I got to do this. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was love for the people and, and a burden for the souls. Without that, it becomes a very yeah. uh, grievous task for selfish human I, beings. But it was still only to the Jews. Yeah. And only in Judea. Yeah. Well, ma mainly in Jerusalem, but... The group here knows, and some of you out there might know, that I spent 17 years in East Africa working among the... in different places there. And for a while I lived on the campus of one of the universities there. And I was asked to give a sermon one time, and I decided that it was appropriate for me to use some verses from Paul where he just talks about being compelled to go and speak. And I said, you know, I'm like Paul, I'm a slave. And you imagine here I am, this white guy, peaching, be, <laughs> speaking to all these Africans, and said, I'm a slave. I'm a slave by choice. What kind of a slave am I? My life is so compelled. I mean, I feel that with, with the truth of the gospel in my, in my heart, I can't keep quiet about it. So I'm a slave to the gospel. And uh, that was the basic message of my sermon. I, I saw them looking a little funny there for a little while. <laughs> you didn't do it slavishly. No, I didn't do it slavery. It was a joy and a privilege, yes. is it not? Well, going back to our story here, many people, no doubt, gathered in the upper room. And we don't know how big that room was, but it certainly couldn't have held a huge crowd. And so fairly quickly, people were trying to get in. They probably moved out of that place. And somewhere in that process, what happened? They heard a noise like a strong wind, which filled the whole house, it says, where they were sitting a noise with a strong wind. Tongues of fire came down and spread out, touching each person. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 1 through 3. Which reminds me of another occasion. Do you remember what happened to Elijah? When he ran from Jezebel and he got down all the way to Mount Sinai, or otherwise sometimes called Mount Horeb, and God says, Come out of the cave, Elijah, I want to show you something. I want to talk to you. And what did he see? An earthquake, a wind, a fire, and God was not in any of those things. And then God spoke to him in a still, small voice. And that's the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. And it's gentle. It doesn't impose and, and, and coerce you, threaten you, intimidate you. Mm -hmm. Truth is like oh, it's on a platter. You can choose to enjoy it or imbibe or whatever. But on this occasion, for whatever reason, the wind was appropriate, the fire was appropriate, and God came. And look at Acts chapter 2, verses 6 to 13. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. Now, we don't know how long the noise went on. They were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speaking in his or her, her own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, these people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? We are from Parthia, Media, Elam. Now, this is far, these people are from far away, from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, in another direction far away, from Pontus and Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, another direction far away, from Egypt, from the regions of Libya and Cyrene. Now they're down in northern Africa. I mean, these people have come from long distances and spoke very different languages. Some of us are from Rome. Both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism. And some of us are from Crete and Arabia. And I have, used to have a, he's passed now, but a, a good friend who was, who was an Arab, Arab Christian. And he said, they were speaking my language. <laughs> he was very proud of the fact they were speaking my language. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm sorry to interrupt, but can we go back to just prior to this, and you said they were in the upper room. Apparently that's where it started. What is that started? I mean, we know that the disciples were up there trying to get themselves together, and then this group of people come. Did they, were they coming to? Well, hear? yeah, I, go ahead. No. Well, they, they heard a loud noise. They heard the wind. So the people came because of the wind. I suspect, been? I suspect that there were people crowding in the room already before the wind. And then a lot more people heard the wind and they wanted to get in. And I mean, uh, this is my speculation, but I think they realized something pretty momentous is about to happen. And so they moved. They, they, because we know as a result of this that 3,000 people were baptized. There's no way there was any room anywhere in Jerusalem that could hold 3,000 people. Well, it, it said that there was such a large crowd that they moved yeah. out. I just, I would just, what was bringing those people on, and yeah. I mean, these people didn't appear overnight from all these different countries. Jerusalem They were there is, for, for the Pentecost. Okay. Okay. And there were a hundred, if I recall correctly, there were 150 that had been converted, or at least were members of the group before the 3,000 joined them. I think 120. Could have been 120. Yeah, no, that's true. And I'm sure that it would, I mean, any room that was available in Jerusalem in those days, even 120 of them would be really jammed in a room. Well, in a number of places in Scripture, for example, Exodus 3.20. The, the, the you know, crux of what you were reading is, is the next sentence. Yeah. Sorry. Let me do that. Uh, I, ver I, verse, uh, the yeah, end of verse 11. Thir 13, well. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? And verse 13, but others made fun of the believers saying, these people are drunk. Do you, do you think the disciples realized as they were speaking that they were speaking in a language that they had no education in? I have wondered that many times. And how many disciples were there? We're talking about 15 distinctly different, at least 15 distinctly different languages. Well, there were 120. Yeah, well, I mean, is that the answer? 120 people were there, oh, yeah. so. Yeah. And well, on the other hand, uh, God was translating the language that they were speaking. It's not that they were speaking those languages. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Were they, mm -hmm. was it the ear that the was The gift of ears. Maybe the gift of ears and not the gift the of tongue. tongue. Gift yeah. of hearing tongues. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, but, the, but the, and there's an important point, we're going to talk more about this later. This is clear evidence that this wasn't glossolalia, as the oh, many churches speak yeah. today, because the people, the entire audience, heard in their own languages. I mean, show me a glossolalia experience where someone speaks and everybody in the, under, in the, in the room understands in his own language. Well, in a number of places in Scripture, for example, Exodus 3.20 and 19.18, 24.16 to 70, Deuteronomy 4.15, John 3.8, and Matthew 3.11. By the way, if you're interested in all these verses and want to have them yourself, you can look them up at our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can download the handouts that we prepare for our discussions together here. So they heard wind and they saw fire. Often these things are used to represent an appearance of God, some, sometimes called a theophany. Wow, what a big theological word there. This event recognizes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early reign was the most open and complete manifestation of the Holy Spirit's work yet seen in sacred history. Fred, tell us more. Yes, in um, Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White, page 37, says the following, the disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. Amen. Pulling away all differences, all desires for supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. They drew nearer and nearer to God 
And as they did this, they realized what a privilege had been theirs in being permitted to associate so closely with Christ. Sadness filled their hearts as they thought of how many times they had grieved Him by their slowness of comprehension, their failure to understand the lessons that, for their great good, He, had, he was trying to teach them. During the patriarchal age, the influence of the Holy Spirit had often been revealed in a marked manner, but never in its fullness. Now, in obedience to the word of the Savior, the disciples offered their supplications for this gift. And in heaven, Christ added His intercession. <coughs> he claimed the gift of the Spirit that might pour for it upon his people. Very good. Well, while there is some evidence that the Jewish people had used baptism as a rite of entrance into their faith, sometimes, it wasn't a widely used uh, event, it really was John the Baptist who made it pro prominent. That same John the Baptist predicted that someone was coming who had baptized them with the Holy Spirit and fire. Look at Luke 3, verse 16. Let's just check out that verse. So John said to all of them, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I am not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. What do you suppose that was like? Sounds scary. Well, it's interesting. Jesus didn't baptize people. And yet we usually yeah. think of this as, uh, at least I've thought of that verse as referring to Jesus' is coming. Yep. Well, look at Acts 11, verse 16. It's very interesting because this is not Pentecost. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be, ba you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that, and this is Peter talking about his visit to Cornelius' home, it is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to stop God? When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God. This, I have to chuckle every time I read this story because, boy, the, the, the conservative Jews back in Jerusalem were ready to jump all over Peter, Peter for having gone to a Roman pagan's house and, and stayed there overnight and preached the gospel to him. And Peter says, guess what? They received the, the, the Holy Spirit, the, the Pentecost, just like we did. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can just, just sort of see, you know, how they respond. And these were the Christians. This is not the Jews. This is the Christians. All truth is progressive. So it's yeah. not like you suddenly, oh, now I understand everything. <laughs> Uh, wouldn't that be a matter of perception that's progressive? Uh, yes. The truth is yeah. available for... Well, uh, if, you, if you can't perceive it... We're just it, saying it a different way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really what the whole book of Acts is, is the progress okay. from step by step by step mm -hmm. of, uh, of the realization that they should take the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, basically what's happening here, God is preparing them to go to the world and talk about the life, the death, the crucifixion, or crucifixion and death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus to heaven of Jesus, and all that that's implied. And you can read about that. The whole book of Acts is basically about that. So that was what we call the former reign. What kind of manifestations of the Holy Spirit's work do you think we'll see at the time of the latter reign? Could something like Pentecost happen in our day? Greater things than these you will do. Can you imagine what that might be like? Wow. There was a series of meetings, and I, I want to be careful how I, use, how I say this, but there are some places in Africa where the Advent message has really just exploded. And they recently took a whole bunch of pastors from, this was fairly recently, uh, to the country of Rwanda. This was not many years after the terrible genocide there. And people were 
just sort of reawakening and, 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 and the Adventist church was growing. They were getting ready to build a university there and so forth. And they had these people all over the country, everywhere, having joint uh, um, evangelistic series is what I want to say, joint evangelistic series. At the end of that series, that all those evangelistic series together, they baptized 90,000 people in one country. And you wonder, you know, if that's the kind of thing that's going to happen in lots of places. Well, one of the most unexpected and remarkable results of the Pentecostal outpouring was the fact that the disciples were able from that time forward to speak fluently the languages of any nation to which they traveled. And Dennis, I think you have some words on that. He was it? Is that um, you? They were oh, dwelling at oh, Jerusalem. There we are. Yeah, I was. I was there. Finding your place. Uh, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Acts two five. During the dispersion of the Jews had dispersion, the dispersion. dispersion. The Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world. And in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem, attending the religious festivals then in progress. Every known tongue was represented by those assembled. This diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance uh, to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did not for the, did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign language. Acts of the Apostles, 39, uh, second paragraph to wow. 40. Try to imagine that. Um, being able to walk, travel anywhere, travel through Europe, and be able to fluently speak any language you came, came across. Gordon, I think you have some additional information about that. From the Adult Bible Study Guide. It is estimated that in the first century there were 8 to 10 million Jews in the world and that up to 60% of them lived outside the land of Judea. Yet many who were in Jerusalem for the feast were from foreign lands and could not speak Aramaic, the language of Judean Jews at that time. There's been a lot of discussion, as all of you are aware, and I'm sure many of you out there are aware, of what exactly happened with this speaking in tongues. It is very clear from the scriptures and from Ellen White that those were true languages spoken by various groups of people. And look at a couple of places, Acts 2, verses 6. We actually, we've looked at these already, but let me let just touch those verses again. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because each one of them heard the believer speaking in his or her own language. These verses describe the languages as, in the original language, as dialectos, meaning languages of a nation or a region. And you compare that with Acts 21, verse 40, 22, colon 22, and 26, 14. This was not just a manifestation of some miraculous power to place God's stamp of approval on what was happening. This was a necessary gift from God to allow for the rapid spread of the gospel throughout the then known world. The fact that some tried to make fun of them, suggesting they had had too much wine, was a suggestion of the devil himself, Acts of the Apostles 40 verse 2, working through the Jewish priests. They accused the disciples of being drunk. Wow. The fact that all those foreign dwelling Jews heard the message in their own languages is clear proof that the accusation was absolutely false. Whenever God does something miraculous, there are those who are going to try to come up with a Always. natural explanation of Always. how this came about. Especially when the message doesn't match their own paradigm. Yeah. Fortunately for us as Christians, 
This accusation inspired Peter to stand up and explain what was happening. And we see, well, look first from the Old Testament, Joel 2, verse 28. It says, afterwards, this is Joel speaking, I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your old people will have dreams. Your young people will see visions. At that time, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, both men and women. Clear back. And Joel, do you remember when Joel lived and preached? Almost 800 years before Christ. Well, Peter picked that up, and, and you wonder, did, did Jesus give them instructions on where to find things in the Old Testament during those 40 days he was with them? Or did people really, did Peter really know the Old Testament that well? Well, he didn't have a chance to go look it up on his iPad or his computer nope. or even the scroll. He had to have it memorized to, yep. to know it. Well, Peter quoted it a little differently. This is what I will do in the last days, not sometime later, as Joel said. God says, I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Yes, even in my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So what did people, what did Peter think they were living? What time were they living in? The last days. He was sure they were living in the last days. It can also be interpreted in the late days of enlightenment. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, no, yes, and they would have thought, okay, now we know that we have the message. We're speaking it to the whole world. All the, everybody is here. When is Jesus coming back, right? It's important to remember, as we noted from Ellen White earlier, that Jesus had carefully taken the disciples through their prophecies in the Old Testament, pointing out how they had been fulfilled by his life and death. Peter picked up some of these arguments and quoted Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Look at that real quick. I am always aware of the Lord's presence. He is near and nothing can shake me. And so I am thankful and glad and I feel completely secure because you protect me from, power, from the power of death. I have served you faithfully and you will not abandon me to the world of the dead. Um, you will not abandon me to the world of the dead. The Greek Septuagint translates that. Uh, we'll look at that in just a moment and demonstrated that Jesus was to be raised from the dead before his body had fully deteriorated. That is exactly what had happened. All of these events were clearly known and remembered well by the people who dwelt in and around Jerusalem. Remember what the two men from Emmaus said when Jesus started walking with them and pretended like he didn't know? What did they say? Are you the only one that doesn't know about these events? Yeah, the only one in all of Jerusalem that doesn't. Where have you been? Yeah. <laughs> Where have you been? Yeah. Uh, they I, have, this large group, 3,000, they would have been there through both feasts. Absolutely. Coming that far, they yeah. cer certainly would have attended both. Yeah. yeah. So they would have been there for the crucifixion. I like to quote these passages and think about them and smile every time I read them. The Lord has a fantastic sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to. The rest of eternity is going to be wonderful. Well, there was no argument about the truthfulness of Peter's statements. They, they knew. They had been there. Of course, Peter's focus was on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This event sets Christianity apart from all other religions. It is our promise and confirmation of life after death. It is important to remember that the priests who were present in that crowd were members of the Sadducees. And what did the Sadducees believe? They didn't believe in the resurrection. resurrection. Oh my God. When you die, you're dead a long time. That was their message. They accepted only what part of the Old Testament? Pentateuch. The books of Moses. The books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. That's the only part they accepted. They did not believe that anyone could be resurrected from the dead. They did not believe that there could be any life after death. When you're dead, that's it. Well, what happens when Peter is standing there in front of them and there's thousands of people listening and he's saying, this Jesus which you crucified and put to death has risen and we are witnesses. I mean, they were furious. Well, when Jesus was endowed with full authority, he sent the Holy Spirit to do what was happening 
before the rise. What, what do you do when you're, I mean, well, I'm happy. I, I, I like to remember that there's a couple of passages. I don't know whether I have them marked in here, but just take a quick look at um, Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. The priests would have come from what group? Sadducees. Sadducees. The Sadducees. So not all the Sadducees were completely blind. And look at Acts 15, verse 5. Now we're talking about the first general conference meeting back in Jerusalem, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, they're believers, but there are Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. They wanted to make sure that Christianity would be a subgroup of Judaism. It would never be anything on its own. Well, all of Peter's speech basically was a marvelous victory, rep recognizing the marvelous victory by Jesus in his conflict with the devil and what we call the great controversy over God's character and God's form of government. Satan could not get Jesus to sin even once during his entire lifetime. Imagine how frustrating that must have been. Nor could Satan get him to give up his mission on this earth and go back to heaven, leaving, just making things so difficult that Jesus would leave and go back, leaving us in our sins. Instead, he followed every detail of God's plan. This is Jesus, followed, followed every detail of his, of God's plan for his life step by step, including finally arising in his own power from the grave. At Desire of Ages 782, paragraph 2. Thus he proved that all of Satan's accusations against him were false. That is what made this event so important. Well, the life and death of Jesus not only made salvation possible for all of us, but also answered the accusations and questions that Satan had made against God, against his character and government. Satan was proven to be a liar and the father of lies, even a fraud. Don't you wish you could have a copy of Peter's entire sermon on that occasion? Mm -hmm. what, did he, what else did he say that we would love to know about? We don't know. <laughs> we weren't there. I'm looking forward to hearing it. It had a powerful effect on his listeners. I mean, the part of the sermon we have, what? It takes, what, three minutes to read it or two or three minutes, something like that, to read the part of the sermon we have? So obviously he went on, he preached much longer than that. And what was the response? What shall we do? What shall we do, Acts 2, verse 37. Peter's response was one that Christians should be working toward even now. He said, repent, repent and be converted, be baptized. In other words, admit that there has been a radical change in the direction of your life. You've turned away from your sins to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Wouldn't that be an appropriate thing for us to call people to do in our day? Well, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that day was rewarded by the conversion and baptism of 3,000 people. And I'm wondering, where did they do that? Was this a baptism of fire from the Holy Spirit, or did they actually find a, a watery place where they could actually baptize people? It was too far to the River Jordan. How, many, how much space does it take to baptize 3,000 people? Well, there was, there was the Pool of Bethesda, and, yeah. and perhaps other pools around there, but uh, that's well, a lot so of all. people. It would just have to take a lot longer. Yeah. Well, this was the first fruits of God's plan for his church that would eventually lead to the second coming of Jesus. Spreading the gospel and convicting sinners of their sins is the main purpose or main reason for the existence of the church. That should be our number one job. Every day we should seek opportunities to share the good news of the gospel. Gordon, right. I think. No. Oh, no, it's Myra, I'm sorry. Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of angels. 
of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and was the anointed one over his people. Acts of the Apostles 3, 30, 38, I'm sorry, and 39. I have a question for you. It almost sounds like Jesus had a number of things to do in heaven to get things ready before, he could, before they could do this. Is, is, that, is that what implied by these? I mean, that he had to receive the Holy Spirit from the Father or receive it somehow or other, and then he could pass it on? Or am I reading too much into this passage? Well, as I mentioned last in the last lesson, the, mm -hmm. that this is the inauguration of the kingdom of grace. Mm -hmm. and I could read the great controversy quote on that, that the kingdom had been promised since the fall, but it couldn't have been inaugurated until Christ died. Mm -hmm. And then at his ascension, he is, um, everything has now been ratified and in uh, place. In place. So he is now able to uh, give the Holy Spirit in its fullness and uh, accomplish, uh, move forward with the work of salvation in the kingdom of grace. And then the kingdom of glory is when he comes again and the transition is the, is the, uh, uh, the judgment mm -hmm. between the two. Okay, now for us living in 2018, we look at Pentecost, we weren't there, we can we can try to imagine it from the things we read, but of course, the most important message would be what what could possibly apply to us from what we see here at Pentecost. What are these? Are there going to be? Is there going to be a bunch of little Pentecosts around the world in different places? Uh, what can we expect in our day? Well, we should pray that we will all be empty vessels waiting to be filled with His Holy Spirit. I think it's that emptying of self that uh, prepares the ground. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly there's education, there's teaching, there's all of these other mm -hmm. things, but uh, the things of the kingdom are often the opposite of what we expect in our temporal existence here. We, they're, they're, you know, we're rich, but we're poor. We're alive, but we're dead, and, <laughs> and on and on. There's all of these things that are sort of turned on their heads. Uh, the, our, uh, the reward of the r righteous, I think, is their capacity to give, because it's mm -hmm. more blessed to give than to receive. So you have all of these things. And uh, in order to, to understand that, we have to be emptied of, of all those things that tie us to the earth. Okay, let me ask you another question. Do you think there have been times down through the history of the Christian church when the people, the Christians at that point in time, actually thought that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was about to come in the form of latter rain? Have there been, at the Reformation, did anyone think that? Certainly, certainly around 1844. Well, 1843 and 1844, did they think that? They thought Jesus was coming back, didn't they? Do we think it? <coughs> well, <laughs> I, I think that in the latter days it'll be just as it was in the days of Jesus, for that matter, because they had to get rid of their preconceived ideas before they could so recognize hard. the value of a new message, which is our problem today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, despite the fact that many Jews, especially the scribes and the Pharisees, had studied intensively what we call the Old Testament. No one had any idea that the Messiah would come, live as Jesus did, be crucified on a Roman cross, and then arise from the dead. 
At that point in time, no human being could have even guessed of such a series of events. I mean, what if you had showed up even, let's say, a year before Jesus was born and said, well, the Messiah is coming. He's going to do these following things. <laughs> what would they have said to you? you know, which planet did you come from, right? I mean, nobody could have dreamed that this, is, this kind of stuff was going to happen. Do you think the devil knew this? Sure. Mm -hmm. Could he have told someone um, to mimic this, be a false Christ? Well, we know that there were false, there were, there were mystery religions mm -hmm. in the time of Jesus. And I don't know how far back they went, but after Jesus, for sure, that believed in, in dying, rising saviors who would, and they were baptized in the blood and all kinds of stuff that sounds vaguely familiar to us as Christians. And so I, I think the devil, and the, the next question, the other, the flip side of that is, okay, what kind of Pentecost is the devil going to produce in our day to, to mislead people today? I mean, if, if he knows, and the devil knows perfectly well that the latter rain is coming and maybe it will be something like the Pentecost, is he going to try to produce fake Pentecost? It would only be like him to do that. Mm -hmm. And Jesus warned about the last days that many will come in my name and or say yeah. he's here or there. So we we have warnings. Yeah. So what exactly did baptism have to do with this conversion experience? Manifestation of a change of life. It's okay. a public manifestation that uh, this person has decided to follow a new direction for life, not one that is self-centered, mm -hmm. but one that is other-centered, yeah. as was Jesus' And life. as Paul describes it, do you remember you, <coughs> you were buried into the water? Basically the idea that the old man of sin has been buried, and then you rise to newness of life, right? Mm -hmm. as, as Fred, as you've, you've just described. Well, while virtually no human being, including the disciples, could have guessed what was coming, Jesus had repeatedly foretold that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. Um, just, just look at a, a couple of passages. I'm, I'm going to look especially at, at John 16, verses 8 to 14. I did not tell you these things at the beginning, for I was with, uh, for I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you asked me where I am going. And now that I have told you, your hearts are full of sadness. But I am telling you the truth, it is better for you that I go away, because if I do not go, the Helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. They are wrong about what is right because I am going to the Father and you will not see me anymore. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world has, al uh, has already been judged. I have much more to tell you, but now it will be too much for you to bear. And when I read that verse, I think, okay, he's been with them, for some of them, for at least three and a half years. Maybe some of them knew him even before that. And he can't tell them, still can't tell them some of the most important things that in the history of our world. I remember that these were the guys that going up to Jerusalem for the crucifixion were still arguing about who was going to be first in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Who was going to be the vice president, they, who was going to be the secretary of state. <laughs> Luke says they were still arguing about that as they were going into the upper room at the Passover. Well, do these promises from Jesus to his disciples apply to us in any way? Can we still claim the promise of the Holy Spirit? Yes. What happens if we do? Well, Cornelius got it after. <laughs> in after a very the, the, remarkable the first way. One. Yeah. Yeah. So, and. I, I'm a Gentile. Well, if we 
if we do receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, how does that impact our proclamation of the gospel message? I mean, Jesus told the disciples, okay, go out and tell them what you have personally witnessed. Do we have anything we can personally witness about? Our experience with the Lord, we, you can't give with it what you don't have. Yeah. So, he, so, go ahead. He also says in the very opening of his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when you'll be persecuted yeah. for the sake of my name or the sake of my character. And that character is all about love. And here we are expected to grow in that love that will end up persecuting us because we become loving people. It's just as Jesus But that said. adds to our witness then, doesn't it? Sure That's does. part of our personal it, it testimony. It certainly is. Absolutely. I, I don't, I'm sure all of you have read books, but there are, there are many of them. People who have written incredible stories about how they were persecuted for their Christianity. Well, it's not likely that many of us will receive the ability to speak foreign languages without having, without having to learn them in a traditional manner, but we need to be so full of the gospel story that we're prepared to tell anyone who asks us. I have lived and worked in several, a number of different countries in my lifetime. I've actually practiced medicine in five different languages. And I know how difficult it is to, be, to learn a new language, especially if it's Swahili when you're used to speaking English, for example. But it's possible. Do you think there will be some Pentecostal experiences connected with the latter rain? <laughs> there has to be. Yeah, yeah. What would happen if you suddenly were in the middle of China and no one has ever heard about Jesus in that area and you were suddenly filled with the Holy Spirit and started witnessing? Any idea with how that will... I mean, just think about being someplace where people... I mean, there's, there's going to have to be times when people are going to be witnessing in places where... People know virtually nothing about Christ. Yeah. We're getting there if Advent World Radio in China right now as we sit here. Yeah. Nepal, parts of India, Pakistan. Yeah. And they're finding villages converted over the radio waves. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the day is coming when the world is going to lose confidence in the political systems of this yeah. world. At that point, people will be forced to do some serious thinking and perhaps to realize there is only one solution, the message that comes to us from Jesus. Which the world will have rejected almost completely by that time, mm -hmm. at least the so-called educated world. Yet we're told that we need shall bow. Yeah. So we must be prepared for that possibility as well. Well, since we're saying that this is the Holy Spirit which was poured out at Pentecost, do we know anything about the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament? Mm. Can you think of some examples? One of the ones that some people point to is Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning when God created the universe, the earth was formless and desolate, the raging ocean that covered everything was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water. So was he, was he back there? Paul says from, in 2 Timothy 3.16, let me just touch on that one real quick. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking, error, and correcting faults, and so forth. So if there was inspired scripture, does that mean the Holy Spirit had to be present? Of course. Then it had to go back at least to the days of Moses, right? We believe that his books were inspired, right? Well, was it Habakkuk? Not, but not by might, but by. No, that's Zechariah 4, okay, verse 6. Okay, yeah. yeah. My spirit says the Lord. Yeah. The work of the Holy Spirit is so important in the book of Acts that it is mentioned about 55 times. Some scholars believe that we should call the book of Acts not the Acts of the Apostles, but rather the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Suppose that you had an experience like that of the disciples at Pentecost. Just suppose that something like that could happen in your day, in our day. Would you feel empowered in speaking to those around you about the good news of the gospel? 
How do you think it impacted the disciples? <laughs> I, th I think they moved forward in faith and, and the miracle of the of speaking in tongues happened. It, it wasn't, you know, of course I wasn't there. How, how did they know? Uh, there seemed to have been, they were speaking things before everybody got there together. So there was some type of conversation before uh, Peter stood up. Yeah. So, uh, be interesting. Well, one hint about how it impacted them is, found, is in the words of Peter that he later spoke straight to the Sanhedrin. This is Acts 4, I'm reading from verse 8. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, that's what we're talking about, answered them, leaders of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man and how he was healed, then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands, and he was standing there beside them at that point, this man stands here before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. And he's talking to a bunch of Sadducees. <laughs> Jesus is the one whom, um, one whom the scripture, oh here I'm pressing the wrong direction on my button, wrong button here, whom the scripture says the stone that you builders despise turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found through him alone, and in all the world there is no one else whom God has given who can save us. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. Was that Peter trying to get along? <laughs> or was that Peter confronting them? Wow. I mean, he just... They must have been boiling inside. When well, especially that they were trying to hide the fact that he had been resurrected. Mm -hmm. And here he is. No, he is the one who made these miracles happen. <laughs> Can't, don't tell me he is not resurrected. Yeah. And the thing is, there were probably other people there listening. And they knew, I mean, this was not some cover job. He wasn't trying to make something up. They knew that what he was saying was true. Well, we know that the author of Acts was the good Dr. Luke. But from reading the book of Luke and the book of Acts, we recognize that he had a very thorough and complete knowledge of Jewish history, customs, and laws. He understood what lessons they were supposed to learn from the Passover and Pentecost. Is it clear in your thinking how these things are related? Don't you wish you knew more of the details of what happened during those 50 days between Passover and Pentecost? Would a more thorough understanding of what happened at that time make us better prepared for what is coming in our day? Clearly, Peter felt that the single most important event that had happened during those days was the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think back over that story. If you have time, read it again from Acts 2, 14 to 39. Was it, that, was it the general pattern of the sermons of the disciples were to preach, that, that first sermon of Peter? Notice that he identified passages from the Old Testament as predicting what would happen in the life of Jesus. Then he recalled the events that had, had just taken place in fulfillment of those passages, and many, if not all, the present in the room there or in the area there knew that these things were true. Then he called for the people to respond. Peter and the other disciples had one central theme to everything they preached. Jesus, incarnate, crucified, risen, ascended, and soon to return. Jim, I think you have something on that. The disciples were to carry their work forward in Christ's name. Their every word and act was to fasten attention on his name as possessing that vital power by which sinners may be saved. Christ's name was to be their watchword, their badge of his distinction, their bond of union, the authority for their course of action, and the source of their success. And the name is really his character and wh yeah. uh, wh what he is re really like. Yeah. That's my understanding. That, that passage is found in Acts of the Apostles, uh, 28. page 28, verse 2. In his sermon, Peter referred to this Jesus. Why did he use that comment, that nomenclature? The common name. Well, we need to remember that his name was not Jesus. 
he was never called Jesus. Maybe one time when the Greeks came. Jesus is an English derivation from a Greek transliteration of Jesus from the Hebrew name Joshua, which was his real name. And there were no doubt many named Joshua living among the people in Judea in those days. So Peter wanted to make sure that everyone understood that he was speaking specifically about the one we call Jesus. Peter wanted to lead people to his cross to remind them of the terrible suffering he had gone through, followed by that incredible triumph when he rose from the tomb. That offered them real hope. They were to accept him as their Lord and Savior. And every sermon preached by a true Christian pastor should challenge his listeners to respond to that Jesus. And I think, you know, I, I, I've tried to struggle in my mind with the question, what made that huge change from being so afraid that they were in the upper room with the door locked until here's Peter standing in front of the Sanhedrin and saying, the Jesus that you killed, and so forth. And I think that a major part of that was recognizing that our lives are not over if we die. There's a whole eternity ahead of us, and Jesus has promised it to us. Well, is it, does it surprise you that 3,000 people were baptized in a single day in Jerusalem? Remember that just a few weeks earlier, many people thought Christianity was dead. Think about the method, method, methods we use today to spread the gospel. Are they the most effective ones? Could we, could we be doing something more? We need to note that some Christian groups believe that speaking when they, what they call tongues is the only proof that they are true Christians. You might want to compare 1 Corinthians 13 with Acts 2 and see if you think those are the same kind of experiences. How would you explain these passages to someone who fully believes that speaking in tongues was, was and is the only evidence of true Christianity? I used to work with some people like that. As a part of the latter reign, do you think the Seventh-day Adventists in our day will actually receive the true gift of speaking? speaking in tongues in some parts of the world? What would you expect to happen to you if the latter rain were poured out now? And I'm throwing that question to you out there. When the latter rain comes, will you be a part of it, and how will it affect you? Our loving Father, these messages from so long ago are so marvelous, so exciting, so thought-provoking. We wish we could have been a part of that, and yet we have, a part, we have the opportunity to be a part of something maybe even more exciting. Help us to be prepared. Help us to prepare others as well for that day, which may be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.